My name is Christina Lucchino and I'm an OCD Massachusetts board member. Welcome to the Les Stradberg Memorial Le OCD Lecture Series. to tonight's lecture. Dr. Michael Jenicki is the medical director of the Obsessive Compulsive Disorder Institute at McLean Hospital and the founder of the Obsessive Compulsive Disorders Clinic and Research Unit at Mass General Hospital. He's also a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Jenicki is recognized as a world-renowned researcher, researcher, having published over 200 articles on obsessive compulsive disorder, geriatric, geriatric psychopharmacology, and neuroimaging in psychiatric disorders. Please join me welcoming him here tonight. I'm going to give a sermon. <laughs> this is titled um, Medication Q&A, but as another year, I don't mind if you ask questions about other things. The medication part is actually the easiest part, pretty straightforward, and it tends to be not a whole lot new every single year. There are some things you probably haven't heard about that I'll mention as we go along. So. You want to ask about behavioral therapy? I don't know anything about it. But, uh, imaging or brains or something like that. Go ahead. So, who has the first question? It's always hard to get the first one out of you guys, and then you just won't shut up after that. Yes. What's the newest thing with the glutamate? I saw that on uh, 2020 or something. Yeah. Well, the, the newest thing with the glutamate is that there are new drugs coming out. Uh, the one that we use mostly is Namenda. Uh, and Riluzol is another one that's quite a bit more expensive, and then there's a cheap one called NAA, and acetylospartate, you can sort of buy in a health food store. They all lower overactive levels of glutamate in the brain, and it looks like OCD is a problem with serotonin, you've all heard that, but a lot of, or some people, I shouldn't say a lot, also have problems with overactive glutamate. Uh, so generally, when we use it, we put people on an SSRI medication, have an effect on serotonin, and then add one of these other medications. They tend to have very few side effects. Uh, like Namenda is used in Alzheimer's disease, uh, given to people over 100 years old with very few uh, side effects. Some people have a dramatic response when you add Namenda to an uh, SSRI. Some have uh, sort of a moderate response, and a lot of people, I'd say, at least half have no response whatsoever. And nobody knows how long you need to try it before giving up. I would probably go at least three months um, before giving up, and make sure you get on the right dose. And, if anybody wants articles on uh, Namenda or any of these other things, I uh, should take your doctor. Just let me know. Email me. I'll give you my email address now. Um, Jenike, J-E-N-I-K-E, at Comcast.net. You don't have to email me, but if you do, I can send you uh, articles on pretty much anything that will uh, come up tonight. Or if you have questions about yourself or your kids or anything like that, uh, try to keep them short because I still get over 300 a day. So. If they're short, I'll get right back. If they're too long, I'll get to that tomorrow. Thanks, sir. You're welcome. I'm sorry, what was the second one you mentioned? Really, so R I L U Z O L E, Namenda, N A M E N D A, and N A C. Again, I can send you articles on all this. If you want uh, a very technical article on how this all works, glutamate in the brain, I can send that to you too. It's kind of hard to understand, but the smart ones, well, I can't figure it out, so probably I shouldn't say that to you. Uh, but there's information and it's understandable. The bottom line is that it seems to work, uh, and we have a pretty good idea what dose it is. The really is is a drug that's used for ALS Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, it's not really very effective for Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, I think the studies have shown that it might prolong life like a week or something like that. Almost, and it's extremely expensive. It almost seems like a, a wasted drug. But for OCD, uh, the people at Yale use it way more than we do. They don't care about cost. Uh, down there in Connecticut, and they have some success with Riazole as well. I would probably start with NAC, which is very, very cheap, or Namenda. If your insurance doesn't cover up these drugs, they can be expensive. I would probably go with NAC, uh, two to three grams a day, but again, I can send you more information. Yes? <laughs> yep, you emailed me yesterday. Yeah. Drugs that you use, and 
the drug companies advertise those drugs a lot um, for depression and the OCD and they recommend adding these other drugs. And because of that, the doctors prescribe them quite freely. I think they're, those are pretty bad drugs that you can first drug. You, you can get uh, full-blown diabetes that when you stop the drug, it still persists. So that, there's a lot of problems with those kind of drugs. So I stay away from them unless they really help. If other things don't help and you stop one of those drugs and you're on a low dose and it really, really does help, then I would recommend staying on that drug. But it, it would be down my list of things to try. No, Namenda's good. Namenda's perfectly safe. I'm talking about Risperidone and Abilify and those kind of drugs. Those are, those are more troublesome, I think. So you, you, you mentioned two uh, medicines. So we, we need uh, just to try one. What's the whole kind of trial? Uh, we generally try one of them. Um, there, you know, there are reasons to think that at two of them or three of them together might be more helpful because they work on glutamate, but they all work in different ways. You, know, you, have, you have the nerves come together, and then the glutamate is a neurotransmitter that's released. Uh, one of them blocks uh, the neurotransmitter being released. Another one blocks the receptors on the second nerve, and the other one takes up uh, the glutamate faster. So they all work in a little different way. Uh, no one has actually, to my knowledge, tried all of the three of the drugs or two of the drugs together. So my another question is that people have some side effects. So uh, people only use the monoxidil before to compete, treat, or to or Well, we generally would use an SSRI, and if you have a response, uh, we'd add behavioral therapy. I mean, I should say, this is, well, I think it's mostly about medication, but the most effective treatment for OCD is not medication, it's cognitive behavioral therapy. And there it used to be there was nobody around who could do it. I mean, 30, 35 years ago, I was just trying to pull people out of all over to try and learn cognitive <coughs> behavioral therapy. Now we have dozens of people, and the whole OCD Institute here, which specializes in OCD, is really uh, based around cognitive behavioral therapy. So that is by far, for most people, the most effective treatment. Uh, a lot of people keep coming to OCD lectures, and they, they hear that, but it goes in one ear and out the other, and they don't do the behavioral therapy. They're looking for some magic drug. And you might wait your whole life waiting for a magic drug, but if you do the behavioral therapy, the drugs may be much, much more effective. So if you only take uh, medication, you might get a response, it might go away. If you do the behavioral therapy, you might be able to hold it really good. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It has to be cognitive behavioral therapy, not just regular, you know, psychotherapy really won't help us again. Yeah, so people, um, so does this still need to go to the it depends how he's doing. If he responds on an outpatient basis, he wouldn't need to. But if he still has symptoms after trying them, I would go there. It's a really good program because it's been going like 15, 16 years now. And the staff there is incredible. They're, they're the best in the world, really. And they deal with people with really, really difficult to treat OCD. So, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if anyone's tried any success I don't, no one has reported success with those drugs alone. They're almost always added to SSRIs. It's, I'm not, I think it might be worth a try. I think most people with OCD do have problems with serotonin, and the Namenda or really so wouldn't have an effect on serotonin. So it, it makes sense to me that you should use the, the two drugs uh, together. I also now have seen uh, in the past year three or four patients that have terrible trouble using SSRIs and they've had a pretty good response to clonopin, clonazepam, which is an anti-anxiety drug. I think it's a relatively small number. Not only their anxiety improves, but some of them their OCD has improved. This is something that just noticed this last year. Uh, you know, anybody now who has a really hard time with SSRIs, I'll try clonopin up to, up to four or five milligrams to see if it helps. For how long do you do that? Uh, you could do it forever, yeah. I mean, you, you don't want to stop those drugs suddenly because you could have a seizure, but if you're, I mean, you have a good doctor and just do what they say, you can, you can try that. Yes? I, um, I came in a little late, so... Um, That's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've seen the, the program of OCD, mm -hmm. um, that's why I just got into the I'm assuming it, and, it, and then I did some reading prior to tonight's mm -hmm. um, lecture. Um, they said that Mass General and Johns Hopkins group was doing a study on them concurrently, and that there were four 
four um, drugs, and I think this is one that's at NAC. I presume that's one of them. Mm -hmm. NAC, Real Diesel, and Nemenda. I don't know what the other one would be. Um, well, there were four, like well, I mentioned, but they said one was um, related to um, acetaminophen, and yeah. if you get that over the counter. That's NAC, NAC. and acetyl uh, cysteine. That's it, that's the one. Yeah, that's what I NAC is short from that. Okay. That's by far the cheapest one. And, and what it, I, I, you may have mentioned this because I came a few minutes late, but could you um, maybe reiterate um, what, what your opinion is on? I know you, well, what we mean, you say the SSRI, but. We've been interested in glutamate here for, well, I'll just say I have, the rest of the people thought I was crazy. Um, early on, I, uh, I'm friends with uh, Nicholas Dogman, who's a veterinarian at uh, Tufts uh, Veterinary School. And he's very interested in OCD and animals. Like dogs that chase their tail or uh, horses that have Tourette's in them that make sounds that horses don't usually uh, make. And, and he was using some of these drugs. So we were talking and he came over and I said, well, why don't we try it in humans? And back then we didn't have all these drugs. So we would use large doses of cough syrup, extra which has some effects on uh, glutamate. Uh, we didn't have any dramatic responses and everybody thought it was crazy, so we just gave it up. But then when these drugs came on the market, we started to try them, and there's really been some success, some pretty dramatic success so with some people. Do you recommend then if someone's on an SSRI to try getting the over? If, if they're doing behavioral therapy and the uh, SSRI is helping, you might not. But if you want to try something else that's safe, you can go ahead and try it and you see, you can see what it does. And Two to three uh, grams. Pretty big though, a day. And can I use Yeah, that's how, usually how we do it. Yeah. Yes. Um, as the Nalanda, uh, you will work on the depression? The, there are uh, some, a few studies saying that Nalanda will help depression and will also help anxiety as well as OCD. Now again, these are not magic drugs. They have helped some people very dramatically, but a lot of people get no effect on what's going on. I know we're talking about it a lot, but I don't want to build up your hopes that you, you try this and this will make everything better. But they're, they're definitely worth a try because there's no really, there's no risks or anything. They're very safe drugs to use. Lexapro is good. Lexapro is an SSRI, and that's one of the main uh, drugs. Abilify is one of these neuroleptic drugs that I prefer not to use those only as a last uh, resort. So I would try Nemenda and you know some other things before I would add uh, one of those drugs. Yes? Hi, uh, my son has OCD and social anxiety and I just have two questions. He's found Prozac, what do you think of that? And also, would this new glutamate help social anxiety? Uh, it might, it might, yeah. When it, when it really isn't nailed down exactly what the glutamate drugs will do, but there are reports that pop up in all kinds of things. Even uh, trichotillomania, people pull their hair out. So it's there's even a report saying it helped that. So it's worth a try. And Prozac is one of the good drugs for uh, OCD. The, the only trouble with Prozac, it's a very long acting. So if you stop Prozac, it'll still be in your system two or three weeks. There'll still be some there. So if you got a bad side effect, it will hang around a while. But generally, people tolerate Prozac fine. It's one of the main drugs we use. What's the maximum dose of Prozac? Well, we generally go to 80 milligrams, which is a high dose. Uh, pharmacists sometimes wonder why we're on such a high dose, but with OCD, you need a higher dose often when you look at the studies. Um, for depression, you might use 20 milligrams. So if you say the highest dose, we've gone as high as 160, I think, I've gone to. Um, and a, a few patients respond to very high doses. It's not something I would try in, in everybody. The other side is that there are some people if they didn't respond to Prozac and then I stopped it and, and uh, we're going to put them on something else, the blood level slowly comes down. So if a patient comes in two weeks later and says, this is the best I've ever felt, I'm not on a medication, they actually are on a little bit of low dose of medication. So I noticed that when you stop the medication, some people actually felt you know, great. And then I started thinking that some people respond well to very low doses of medication. And then they start like, you know, maybe give them two and a half or five milligrams of Prozac a day. And some people have a great response to that, but they don't respond to the standard dosages. That also is very unusual, maybe a couple percent of patients. So they're all, if someone comes to me and they've tried, you know, five SSRIs and nothing's helped, uh, then I'll, I'll try the low dose or high dose, but more likely low dose approach. Yes? Um, I'm a 
that, that was kind of my question as far as the data exercise. I guess it's going to move off some and cancels and be switched over to um, OSAP. Uh -huh. So do you typically run the gamut with those groups? Yeah, that's, um, there's a lot of SSRIs on the market now. People, uh, a lot of psychiatrists think if you've tried one, they all work the same way, and then you don't need to try any others. That just means the SSRIs don't work. That's definitely not true. Uh, and we do generally run the gamut, that's not the way you put it. But it, it takes, you know, up to three months to have a good effect. So you, if you do a three-month trial of Prozac, you're really, that takes a while, and another trial. So you, you can do a couple years of trials of, of SSRIs. I think every SSRI that you fail, you're probably less likely to respond to the next one, if that makes sense. So if you fail five SSRIs, uh, you probably look little likelihood to respond to the next one. But there are some people, there are a handful of people that will, you know, these drugs came on the market sequentially, sequentially and we try the, the new drug, and a few people will respond to the new drug, even though they've failed uh, a lot of the other drugs. So it's definitely worth trying sequential trials. Do you feel that there's one that typically no, there's no one drug that's better. It really is an individual thing. One drug can be great in one person and terrible in another. Um, it's really, uh, there's no way, and some of that work that was on the, on that TV show did sort of uh, highlight that there maybe will be a way in the future to predict some of these things. And we've been doing, um, uh, getting DNA from patients and then we're going to look back at uh, if there's some DNA marker that would predict response to a particular medication. Right now, it really is trial and error, pretty much. You try something, and I, the way I would do it, I, there's not, I can't give you the best drug. I can tell you which ones are likely to be a problem, and those would be my last choice. Like Paxil has tons of weight gain problems and a lot of sexual side effects. So I tend to stay away from Paxil. The Nafranil has anticholinergic effects. You get constipated and your heart can race, and you can actually interfere with your thinking if you get uh, older. So I kind of don't use Paxil as the first choice, and. Um, stay away from an afrenil in most people. But if you don't respond, some people have a great response to Paxil or an afrenil. So they're, they're worth trying, but maybe not the initial drug. Yes, in the back. Uh, two questions. One. Does Why does everybody have two questions? <laughs> <laughs> does Lexapro have a shelf life like Prozac or Burn has a shelf life? A shelf life for how long you can keep it before it doesn't work? No, uh, like how long it works in your system until it plays. Oh, half life. Yeah, half life. Yeah, Prozac uh, is metabolized to norfloxacine. Prozac is fluoxetine, and that has a very long half-life. So if you're a if you're a 70 year old person and you're on Prozac for a while and you stop it, you can still measure something in uh, you measure some in the blood a month later. Um, with the other drugs, it gets out of your system in a few days. But so does it stop having an effect after a certain amount of time? Um, the effect may not actually be due to the having the blood. A blood level of Prozac. So when the blood level gets out, if Prozac was working, it might take two or three months to relapse, even though there's no, there's nothing in there. So something happens in the brain that persists when you stop the uh, medication. So if you are stopping a medication, you've had a good response. You need to be very careful the first few months because you're you're likely to, you know, that's the highest time for relapse, and then you need to do the behavioral therapy really intensely during that time. Does that make sense? All they said. Yeah, well, I guess Prozac's the one that's different than the other and has a much longer half-life. So I'm, on, I'm using Lexapro, is that one? That's that a shorter... Fade, does it fade out, like the efficiency fade out after a while? Oh, it, do you become tolerant to it? Basically, yeah. if, you, if you stay on the medicine, does the effect go away? Correct. It's The technical term is poop out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I didn't think that. I should have, maybe it did. Um, it, with depression, uh, that happens quite a bit when you're on these medications and you stay on it and the effect kind of poops out. With OCD, that doesn't happen so much. Um, what you can do is, if it if it poops out, you can raise the dose uh, another level. I don't know if any of you are on MAO inhibitors, but those drugs poop out at least half half of them poop out in like six months. I don't say poop anymore. I promise. That's a phobic word for some people. Uh, the second sorry. question I had was more of a uh, non-medication. Uh, do you have ruminations and stuff like that? Do I have ruminations? No, no, not you. <laughs> I will after it, this. But. If you have ruminations and you try and thought diffusion, like, and it's not working, what what, what do you recommend? What actually is thought diffusion? What, what do you mean by that? Um, Everybody has their own definition of these kinds yeah, of Yeah, I've been through the OCDI, so just like trying to take the thought and just value it or kind of, you know, associate it with a different meaning, kind of make fun of it or... Well, generally the approach with obsessive thoughts is to just 
learn to let them pass. Like these kind of thoughts, obsessive thoughts, everybody gets them in their head when it's been studied. Everybody has these thoughts. But if you don't have OCD, and then I've had terrible thoughts for the first 10 minutes here. I don't have OCD, so they just go through my head and they leave. If you have OCD, somehow your brain manages to hang on to them. And then you try to interpret them and think about them and wonder why you have it. And are you a bad person because you have that? So what you have to learn is how to process the thoughts like a person without OCD. The best reference is a book called The Imp, I-M-P of the Mind by Lee Baer. And he goes, it's a, it's a really simple um, read and it really goes through how to manage these kinds of obsessive thoughts. So you don't actually want to sit there and process it, I don't think, and try to devalue it. You want to just learn to handle it like everybody else does and just let it be there. The thought's there, okay, now just go do what you're going to do. It would be a, probably a better way to do it. Because if you're trying to do process the thought somehow by devaluing it or something else, that's actually a ritual. You know, it's like a mental ritual, like washing your hands, and you're doing it uh, with your thinking, and that generally makes uh, OCD stay in there to make it worse. Does that make sense? Yes. You had next. Yes. Uh, what can you say about the discovery that hoarding might involve a flaw on chromosome 14? I don't know much about that, but I think. There's going to be way more of that kind of stuff. As we've done all kinds of studies now in uh, large groups of patients with OCD and Tourette's, and they're looking at hoarding separately. So they have all of these patients are, are lumped together now. So it's kind of hard to, to figure out genetically what's going on. So as we make, uh, it's called the phenotype, I mean, whatever symptom you have. If someone purely hoards, and you have 100 people who purely hoard, and you can look at their DNA and compare it to people who who don't have uh, hoarding, you can actually find differences. So these are all like early studies now, but this is really promising for the future, I think. But then if you, fi if you find a, a marker, a genetic marker, uh, one of the genes is not doing something, it's either not producing something or producing too much, you still have to figure out what to do about that. I mean, do you, want, do you block something or do you produce something or give something extra? It's a really long process to figure out what to do even after the gene has been identified. Who, who, whose work would we look under to find out more about it? Well, there's a lot here. Evelyn Stewart has headed up a lot of this in the past. <coughs> in, uh, what's his name? Um, I can never remember this guy's name. He's a vast general, he does Tourette's and OCD, really, really smart young guy. And he's doing this now with Evelyn. You can look up Evelyn Stewart. And there's like, um, they, they fall to Evelyn Stewart. And um, these other people have studied, have gotten samples from the whole world. 40, 50 different clinics, and they pool them together. It's important to have huge sample size to make answer to these questions. And there's really a collaborative effort now in the whole world in trying to look at these things and figure it out. They're also extremely expensive. Like one study can be three to five million dollars. So there's so many people and complicated things involved. I didn't answer your question, but that's probably the best I can do now. Because there's all kinds of, um, even with OCD now, we have some of the glutamate genes look like they're involved in OCD, which kind of is nice. The glutamate genes, and we see clinically that some of the glutaminergic drugs are helpful. I got ramble on tonight. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Well, speaking of studies, are, are there any um, studies that have particular uh, follow-up or long-term studies on? There are. I don't deal with kids very much, but, but uh, Kyle Williams and Dan Geller work with me doing. There are. They they use the same drugs and even the same doses sometimes in kids. Uh, you know, if the low doses don't work, they they go up. And it looks like the drugs are safe in kids, just like they are in uh, adults. So, for an adult who decides that they want to have a Well, if people want, or people are talking about stopping medication, uh, I always used to go along with that. You know, when we get pregnant, they want to stop medication. And then, I, uh, I don't know, maybe 50 years ago, I started to have a few patients that had a great response to medication, and they stopped it. And then usually, if you start the drug again, you have a, the same good response. I had a few people that didn't get the response then. It was like the drugs didn't work anymore. So then I, I didn't know what to do about that. So what I basically do now is just tell people it's a risk. It's a small risk, but there is a risk if you stop the drug that the drug might may not work again. 
um, in the future. And you know, sometimes if you wait a year and try it again, then the medications will work. But, but behind all of this, you have to be doing the behavioral therapy. Because that's the thing that will, will keep the OCD under control while you're stopping medications. Did that answer your question? Yeah. You sure? <laughs> there will always be more questions. Uh, yeah. So, um, do you have some experience, or does anybody have any experience with people who are very resistant to taking drugs? I mean, given that that's such a... Oh, it's very common, yeah. People obsess about taking drugs. So, any... Well, basically what you have to do if, if people are they're obsessing about taking drugs, you need to get have them working with a behavioral therapist that they trust. And it can be a long process. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's only a few sessions. Sometimes the therapist will have to take a drug in front of them and they make it together. I mean, uh, sometimes we'll have to have a therapist go to the house in the morning to talk to them about taking the drug. Uh, there are surprisingly few people lately who don't want to take, who you know, have a hard time taking medication. It used to be very common old days, but now there's so much evidence and data for the medication work, more, more people are, are interested in, in trying medications. Um, I feel like I'm on a lot of medication, but... I didn't do it. <laughs> but it works. If we try taking some away, that's... Like how many medications for OCD? Well, it's for OCD and depression, so it's a common It's so like a handful. Two handfuls. So, what's your question? Do you have some patients that work well with just one? Many people work well with one if they seriously do the behavioral therapy again. Um, if you don't work one well with one and you have a good doctor, you can try uh, different things. One thing, if you tell me what you're on is working very well, I don't ever argue with people's success. If you tell me you feel great and you're on those medications and they're not doing you any harm or damage, then I would say go for it, you know, make sure your doctor is monitoring you. But I don't think you, you know, you could look through and say which of, which of the ones that are most likely to be helpful, like unhelpful, like the neuroleptics that cause side effects. I might try occasionally to taper those down and see if you can get off the ones that are more toxic. But most of the medications are, are relatively safe. And there are people that are on a lot of medications, and if they're doing well, then I think that's fine. I was lucky enough to stay at the Institute for almost two months, and Behavioral therapy is very, yeah. Very helpful. It's, yeah, they're really good there. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, when we put that place together 15, 16 years ago, that was the main theme that we have really good behavioral therapy. And, and that's been the, sort of the, the savior to treat the people with really severe OCD. But you really need competent behavioral therapists with a lot of experience. And they have to be kind, too. Like if you have the old, militaristic ones that you know that don't understand how much suffering people are in, it really doesn't work. You have to trust the behavioral therapists. Not early on in my career I had somebody heard somebody say that if you have bad OCD and you work with a behavioral therapist, it's like telling them to go up on top of the Empire State Building, blindfold them and just fall backwards over the edge. That's how much terror there could be for some people. And then we see the people, you know, doing the exposures. I mean it takes a lot of bravery. Um, but if you have a good behavioral therapist, they can work out very slowly, and it doesn't have to be that terrible. And people, you know, the reward is that you can get this under control. It's a huge reward. Yeah. Yeah. I tried the first week too because the patients blocked up all the toilets. Yeah, we thought we were going to be like a really a liberal group there. We're going to let people come and go to the bathroom and everything. And then, like the first three, uh, we're worried about contamination. But in the toilet, block the door, use all the toilet paper, and block the main sewer line, the plain hospital. So we, we gave that up. Uh, we can't trust you guys at all. Yes. Yeah. Any question? My teenage daughter. Uh, was prescribed. My wife, for I don't know what reason, was nervous about an SSRI, so she was prescribed uh, lorazepam for anxiety. Mm -hmm. Is that a good? Uh, not lorazepam is like some people don't respond to SSRIs. Uh, respond to clonopin. It looks like no, it's not ever been studied. Lorazepam is a short-acting drug like clonopin. It is, it is possible that that could be doing some good. If, I would think that it would mainly be helping anxiety yeah. and not particularly OCD. But if, if that allows her to do the behavioral therapy then, and it's working, then that's fine. Yeah. Also, what was the book that you recommended? Oh, the one about obsessive thoughts. Yeah. The, the IMP of the Mind by Lee Bear. 
Okay. He probably gives a talk there every now and then, I suspect. Let's see, who hasn't had that? Behind you. Did you ask him? Um, yeah, my doctor prescribed Adderall with Prozac, ProCD. Do you think that's... Well, usually if we use Adderall with Prozac, a uh, patient has probably has ADD or ADHD as well. No? No, that's... That would be unusual no, then. So but but that, what I would ask then, does it work? But I didn't know if it was... It's not a standard thing to, thing to do. do. No. You might have a doctor who deals a lot with ADHD and likes Adderall. No. <laughs> probably, is it? Probably, I suspect. Um, we use it if people have, you know, sometimes we have patients with bad OCD come to the OCD Institute and they're so, have so much, such bad ADHD, they're walking around between groups, they just walk around the building and sometimes we give them uh, Adderall and they calm down and it's much easier for them to just pay, pay attention to things. ADHD, even today, can be, can be either overdiagnosed or underdiagnosed, but Adderall is really good for people with classical ADHD. But for just using it for regular uh, OCD, do you know that you wouldn't just respond to Prozac alone? Um, I have, I don't want to get into the specifics, maybe she thinks I, I have ADHD. You had a what? Oh, we don't need to hear any details. Yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> I, know honest, I don't know exactly why it was added, but it was added. It did seem to help me focus better, but. Well, fo it, it will help focus. That's a drug for, for yeah. maybe. <laughs> maybe he feels you have a little lady or ADHD. It allows you to focus more on If it did help you to focus, then that's, that's a useful thing. Is it like a low dose? One to five, one to five? It's 215. It's pretty well, that's a pretty good dose. Is it? Yeah. Well, I mean, you can go, you can go a lot more. But that's a, that's a reasonable. In the very back. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> I'm at the OCDI Institute, and I have two I questions. Can't hear you because you're talking through this desk. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Um, I'm currently at OCDI, uh -huh. and I am on medication. Um, but my question is, if at some point I'm married and I want to have kids, and I'm the question, should you get married before you have kids? I'm already married. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> what, what will I do when that time comes? It's safe to stay on my medication? Like, how do you work with a patient that, you know... person wants to get pregnant, pregnant. And on medication. Yeah, that's a very common problem I hear lately, at least a couple times a week. Um, the drug for which there's the most experience of safety is Prozac. If you could be on Prozac, uh, that would help. Uh, if you're doing cognitive behavioral therapy, there's no side effects to that. Um, there's a website. Uh, if you look up Lee Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, he's at Mass General. He has a website on using psychotropic medications in pregnancy. He has all the latest data there. He has, I think, thousands of people check that a day. So I usually send people there. But the SSRIs look like they're pretty much generally safe uh, in pregnancy. If at all possible, it's good to just do behavioral therapy and get off medication because not everything is known. But if you have to be on a medication, it looks like SSRIs are probably in the safer category for medication. Okay. And then my second question is, is I have contamination issues, and my therapist back home had me start with smaller fears on the hierarchy and work my way up, where now they're really tackling, like, bigger fears, because if you don't get the brain, they're saying, like, if we don't get you into it, then it won't re-trigger the brain. So is that truth, or is it just different for each person? Well, you know, you make a hierarchy of the things that you're least afraid of and go up a little more, a little more, to the thing you're most afraid of. Okay. And at the OCD Institute, you'll start somewhere, and the therapist working with you will find out what you've done in the past. And if you've tried some of these littler things, it might be uh, better to go up something that causes you even more anxiety and start higher up and go up. Like if you just keep doing things that are mildly anxiety-provoking, um, it might not work. Sometimes you have to feel, you know, fairly uncomfortable in order to get the response. So once you do the exposure and you get you get really anxious, and then it starts to come down and levels off, uh, and then you can go to the next thing, next level, and that will come down and level off. Then that's in theory how it should work. So if your behavioral therapist making an assessment based on your history, then that's a reasonable place to start. They also want you to start as high as you can because it's a residential facility with a lot of support from a lot of people that help you. So on an outpatient basis, you have to go slower, probably maybe more uh, conservative. But in a place like that, where there are people watching you all the time yeah. and know exactly where you're going, it makes, it makes more sense probably to start as, as high as you can. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Your corner in the back. I have two questions. Um, 
one of them is, uh, how about supplements like the uh, ubiquinol and omega-3? Do they have any effect on uh, some of these drugs you're talking about? Um, omega-3s are highly recommended now for almost all psychiatric illnesses. Um, most patients are not on them. Some patients say that it does give them a feeling of uh, well-being and they're better able to do the behavioral therapy. But there's tons of literature on all that stuff, and a lot of that comes out of these clinics in California. Germany does some pretty good studies on, on, um, on some of these things. But um, the question is probably should you be on those things? And the answer is you, you should try the things that have been carefully studied and documented to be helpful probably before trying all those supplements. But we've had people come in there on 15 supplements uh, and haven't taken one of the, you know, even an SSRI. Some people like supplements better than medication, but supplements are drugs too. I don't, to me, I don't see the big difference. Well, the other, the other question would be, because you... A little louder, please. The other question older, is, yeah. how, most of the studies tend to involve younger people. What involves younger people? The studies. I the mean, studies, yeah. are there studies that they, they take a group of people over 65? They wouldn't even include women at first in the studies we're doing. Because they could get pregnant. Like they wouldn't even let us put women in the studies. Now that's against the law. You have to put women in the studies. I mean, like women aren't smart enough not to get pregnant if they're in the studies. I lobby for you. So the question is, what, how do these drugs affect older people? Well, yeah, but they do studies so they know. I mean, in other words, most studies, they end like at 55. Yeah. What about, are they doing studies at 55 to 80 or anything? Oh, uh, when I was doing a lot of these studies, they were all cut off at 65. Now that I'm way older than 65, that seems like criminal. But <laughs> I don't actually know that. I'd have to look. I mean, in OCD, I don't think that they're raising the age past 65, maybe depression and other disorders uh, they are. But you're absolutely right, if you don't, you know, could, there could be problems with over uh, 65 with medications. We know one thing is that the older people metabolize drugs slower, so you start with a lower dose and you go up, you know, you go up slower. But some people age 65 or 80 even need the full dose, they metabolize the drugs just like a 20 year old. So you have to start low and go up gradually and monitor side effects. So it's a, you have to be just a little more cautious when you're treating people that are older. That are older. But the drugs work the same way in older people, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah? I have a question. Um, why do you see ads for like Lullaby and like Rexer and people? Yeah, they, they should go to jail for doing that. <laughs> they say that the older adults, they're more at risk for stroke. Do you know why? Uh, no, but I don't think anybody knows why the neuroleptics uh, are cause stroke in older people. I'm not even sure they do cause strokes more. Older. It's just that older people are more likely to get strokes. Right. Uh, then you put them on these the medications. And people are, know that these medications are not the safest things in the world to use. So um, I think the more warnings they have out there, the better. You hear these advertisements, how it'll improve your depression, and then they have these, a guy talking really quickly about all the things that are going to happen, and you might die. Um, so, the, you know, with OCD, you guys pick that stuff up. That doesn't go in one year, not the other. So, um, but, that, yeah, the doctors are pushing these, well, I think, consider fairly toxic drugs. I mean, basically, the way I look at medications is that I wouldn't prescribe a medication I wouldn't take myself if I was in your situation. And I would not take those drugs unless I tried everything else. So it's pretty simple to me to figure out what to do. Or, you know, my son or daughter is in there, would I give them this medication? The answer is no. Uh, unless they tried everything else and they were really suffering, then I would have. But, but it's way down the list of things to try. They used to pay doctors to prescribe these medications in the old days. It was really pretty criminal. I, they didn't pay me enough for it. Yeah. In the back. You mentioned that, uh, you mentioned if you go off certain some medications, you carry a risk. Mentioned what? I'm sorry. A little you, you mentioned if you go off of medications, you uh -huh. carry a risk of the effectiveness going away or getting less or going more completely. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been, have you ever observed the reverse effect where someone else, someone picks up an effectiveness in that drug years after taking it, for example? Wait, like they, they, do they lose effectiveness? No, gain effectiveness. Gain effectiveness the when, they, effectiveness. when they keep taking the drug or when they stop it? Say they take it five years previously and have no effect, they stop taking it five years later. Well, yeah, I mean, you do see people that are not on medication and they just get better for unknown reasons. I think OCD in general has a cycle and it gets better and it gets worse and it gets better and it gets worse and the medication is just kind of lower it down. Medication are hardly ever totally get rid of OCD, but it, it lowers it down so the cycles are much lower. And if you, so if you, if you lower the cycle of medication, then you do behavioral therapy, you can even like minimize the uh, 
black hole. But definitely people can get better as they get older. That doesn't usually happen. No, that's not, not a common asking. thing, but it can happen. That's not what I'm asking. Okay. I'm asking if um, an ineffective medication can later in someone's life become effective. Oh, oh, if you try it and it doesn't work. Yes. So uh, you try it later. Yeah, that absolutely worth that. Try it again later. That does occur, yeah. I, don't, I have no explanation of why, but you can try a medication that doesn't do anything, and then later on, uh, you know, maybe you're not as depressed, or maybe something else has changed, or you're eating different foods, and so the medication might work. Yeah, that definitely does occur. Yes? Um, I wanted to ask your opinion about citrulline. Mm -hmm. You talked a lot about drugs there, and I wanted to ask what you thought about that, and what dose is there. Have you talked to me Yeah, um, the dose we use we generally go to a higher dose, so we go to 200 milligrams of sertraline, and it's as good as the other uh, medication. There, there, there are, let me just say, there, is, there are studies that are a little bit deceptive, saying that, you know, this drug is a little better than this, is better than this, is better than this, better than this, and they make a list of the ones that are most and least helpful. The, the ones that are the most helpful is the one that came on the, on the market first, and the ones that are least helpful is the one that just came on the market last. And what, that, what happened was that we and maybe four or five other centers did these studies. So they were, patients would come to us, and if they responded to the first study, Prozac, or an Afro, actually, so if they responded to that, they would stay on the drug and we wouldn't put them in the study. So the people that didn't respond, we would put them in the Prozac study. Uh, and then if you failed an Afro, then we put them in the Luvox study. So you have people that have already failed medication, so they're less likely to respond. So that makes it look like the first drug on the market was actually better, but they weren't all compared head to head. Uh, so, certainly is a, is, a, is a very reasonable drug. And um, the other question I get is, um, what do you think the MRI Well, MRIs, I think, really for OCD are research tool. If you had take one person and you, you do all kinds of MRIs, you couldn't look at that MRI and tell if that person had OCD. And you had another MRI and they didn't have OCD. You could not tell. There's nothing that dramatic where you can tell someone has OCD with an MRI. But if you take if you take 50 patients with OCD and compare it to 50 without, you can see differences. Uh, in our early studies, I think we had like 10 patients in study, we saw that the OCD patients uh, had more gray matter than normal controls. It's easier to find OCD people uh, than uh, normal people in Boston. So. <laughs> <laughs> why, why did the uh, baseline number of people see a difference? It's, it's based on statistics. You have to have a whole, you have to have a big sample, and then you get a mean value. Oh, so they don't see. Yeah, and then you get another sample, and these mean values right. separate. But, but there's a lot of overlap. And, and how, Let me finish that statement. Though. You have more gray matter and you have less white matter. So as your brain develops, you actually lose some gray matter and you lay down more white matter. So it could be that OCD patients are thinking too much with all this gray matter and the white matter processes it, connects them around. Maybe there's not enough connections to make sense out of this. Something. Therefore, people get these alarm reactions or they, they can't be certain or they're worried about something. There's a, there's a lot of possibilities of, of what this could mean. But if, if it is a developmental issue, it could be due to a virus. We know the strep can uh, cause pandas and OCD and uh, mono, uh, H1N1. There are all kinds of infectious things. We just started a, a special clinic for this. Kyle Williams recruited him up from Yale to look at infectious causes of OCD. He's mostly dealing in kids. It's mostly in kids. So there's a lot of ways you can get OCD. So how do you, uh, what, what are your feelings about well, we don't see, we don't we know that's the finding in the MRI, but we don't know what caused it. It could be genetic, it could be a virus, uh, there, it could be any number of things, and it probably is. It probably is genetics, and we know that viruses can do it too. So that, I think OCD is not just one illness. There's probably 50 different Ill illnesses, and the brain reacts to certain kinds of insults, genetic or whatever, with these symptoms of OCD, the thoughts or rituals and all that kind of stuff. There's only so many ways probably a brain can, can react. So, the, But there's many causes. Like if you think of pneumonia, there are probably a hundred things that can cause pneumonia, right? Uh, all kinds of infections and, and genetic things and so forth. So it's sort of like that with OCD. When it's ever figured out, there'll be a lot of things that cause OCD. It won't just be one cause. 
you know, if, if it was only one cause and it was all genetic, we would have seen that in the genetic studies so far. Well, yes. Who's your behavioral therapist? Um, Nate. Nate. Nate's great. Yeah. If you don't do the self ERPs and figure this out about 10 years ago, and you go home, you won't relapse. You have to do the self. You have to do the exposures and the treatment yourself. So when you go home, you're you're able to do it. But you still got some more time. Yeah. Is it getting better or not? Well, we're starting to practice this now. All right. Sometimes there's like a breakthrough after a couple of months. Feel like I see the light now and I can do something I can do. All right, sorry, I thought it didn't say you didn't get your no. question. Um, two questions. One is what do you think about um, things like cycle surgery, like um, deep brain stimulation? Yeah, that, we, we do that. Dr. Darren Doherty has that part of a uh, section of the uh, calls invasive treatments. And deep brain stimulation is one of the latest things where actually, I think she has some good slides. But, if we're going to talk about real things here, I'll bring on my slides. They, what, basically what you do is you put a pacemaker right. under the wall and then you run an electrode into parts of the brain and you can stimulate it. And you, yeah, it was started in, uh, in Parkinson's. So you have patients with Parkinson's disease that can't walk and they're tremulous. Tremulous. Uh, that's good. And then, you know, they're like this and then you turn on the stimulator and they stop and they can walk and then very dramatic. With OCD, it's not like sudden like that. But if you if you keep the right frequency uh, for a while, some people's OCD gets a lot better. It's definitely worth uh, considering if other things don't work. We've had a number of patients who've had great responses to surgery. There are many other approaches like cingulotomy. Um, you know, there are all kinds of things that have been done. There's a lot of nuttiness about brain surgery. You should be very careful if you're going to do that. Make sure you you talk to Dr. Doherty or people know what they're doing. Because there was a guy in uh, Tulane in. in New Orleans, Louisiana, and he was just sticking needles in people's brain, and, if the, and the person's away because the brain doesn't really have pain receptors, and he says, oh, that feels like my uh, Tourette's uh, feeling. He would burn that part out, and he, you know, some of his patients lost speech and stuff. It's just totally crazy. So, and there are some nuts around. There's a study in Sweden where they said if you damage this particular area, they said exactly where it was, that patients are highly likely to get better. So I thought, wow, this is awesome. So we were going to do a study. Uh, you can do a uh, controlled trial with, um, with a gamma knife and then had the guy come over, he had no idea where this thing was, he just made it up. Uh, he was, you know, he was sort of an internationally known guy, but he was a total fraud. Uh, so you have to be very careful of, of the stuff that's out there. Is deep brain stimulation very expensive? Uh, if you get in a study, it probably isn't. You should talk, you know, Dr. Doherty? I've heard. Yeah, he's at the OCD Institute. I can, if you email me, I can give you his email address and you can ask him directly. I think I see him. Yeah, he, he's a good guy. The other question I grew up with question is about, pand about pandas. Uh -huh. I've been told to try plasma paresis. Um, uh -huh. I've never really had onset, sudden onset. That would, it, would it would probably be an expensive waste of time. Right, that's right. Pandas is pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with strep. It can also, there's another term called PANS where it's not a strep but with all kinds of other things. I other had a lot of Did you? Yeah, but I mean, how many of you had a strep as a child? So, almost everybody had, you know, had a lot of strep too. And I'm perfect. Uh, so I think uh, you can't just, because you had strep as a child, that's not a good reason to do it. I, I wouldn't, most people wouldn't do it without recommendation. But if, if you have a child, and this is not well known, but then they, overnight they get like a sore throat and they get an infection. And overnight they get all terrible OCD. Like the world is contaminated, please kill me because I can't stand these germs. I've seen videos of parents of kids, it's just unbelievable. And they go to the doctor and they say, well, we don't believe it in this. Like we don't believe in Canada. So they, the government, uh, NIMH, actually blocked all research into this for 10 years. 
Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, so we went down there and I took these parents in their videos to see Tom Insel at Edmund and he took the people out that were blocking me. So now we can actually study this because a lot of psychiatric illnesses I think may be infectious, may be the cause. But once you've had it for a while, treating the infection won't do any good. But if you have a child with a sudden onset, then treating with antibiotics uh, might more likely to be effective than using the SSRIs and so forth. It's a whole, it's a whole new area that I think will be really, really important. Yes? Um, my question is this, and I know that you've spoken about it a, a reference to it a, a couple times, but it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Doctors will say, well, we'll try this, but if, if that doesn't work, well, we'll go to another drug. And I also heard you say that if you've done a trial of several medications and they've been ineffective, then the likelihood that a new medication is... It might be effective, though. The likelihood is less, but it so still my, might be. My question is, it, it's so frustrating as a patient when you hear that... It's frustrating as a doctor, too. Huh? I suppose so. I suppose so. <laughs> Because you want to be able to, you know, talk to the patient, figure out what's on, and start them on a medication. But it's the same kind of thing in rest of medicine, it's like with gout or infections. You know, there are all kinds of unknowns, and you do trial and error. And it's such a lengthy period of time. But if you're using, if you if you work with someone who has a lot of experience, they can often make things quicker. You know, they can figure out what will likely be likely to help. Like if you responded to a medication before. You can try that medication again. If you have a family member who responded to Zoloft, then, then try Zoloft because you have similar genes. So, but it, but it, it is frustrating. Uh, and some people don't get a response even after trying all these medications. And should one, um, I also heard you say which has been phenomenal, um, that there's the hierarchy of drugs. Did I hear you right? That well, that's there are studies that say that. But in one person, you cannot tell which drug is most likely to be helpful. So really Just eliminate Paxil probably an afternoon as a drug to start with, and you could pick any of the others. So how do you know when a patient comes to see you? How do you know which one to assign as your Well, I ask if you, have you been on a medication for the health? Do you have a family member who's been on medication? Then I say, yeah. No. Then I say, do you have, uh, have you been reading anything? Do you have good, good uh, vibes about a particular medication? And then I'll just start one. Yeah, I'll, I'll see which drug company will pay me the most money and I pick out. <laughs> no, basically it doesn't really matter and I don't want to start the same drug. It's, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter. And often the patient will really get a good, you know, partial response to the first medication. And how do you know when to um, raise the dosage or, 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 or um, on the converse? How do you know which yeah, well that, that's easier. There are studies looking at different doses, like Prozac 80, 60, 40, and 20. And 20 milligrams didn't work in one study, and another one worked a little bit. And as you go up to the higher doses, it seems that more patients get a benefit. So generally you want to go, like, let's just talk about Prozac as an example, want to get to 80 milligrams as soon as possible. So I'll just ask the patient, are you having side effects? If they're not, then we, you know, we can raise the dose every few days or, or uh, once a week. If I, since it takes three months to have a full response, if I want to know if 20 milligrams works, then I have to do 20 milligrams for three months, 40 milligrams, I mean, you have a whole year just to do so I, I try to get it to 80 milligrams, and then, yeah, and then if the patient doesn't really have side effects, keep them on it for a while, uh, and then if they have a good response, again, behavioral therapy in the background, then I will gradually taper it off, you know, over a couple of years if they have significant OCD. So I'll go over 80 to 60 for maybe three months, and then 40 for three months. To see which is it's Try to find the lowest job. dose, yeah. I find it that way because then the patient has a chance of having a good response, you know, within three months rather than waiting over here. Yeah, and what do you do, do you, do you, a person with OCD, do you, uh, I think I've answered this also. Um, Sometimes you, I answer things by mistake. <laughs> do you always, uh, would you, for their duration of their life, would you say the therapy and medication Couple together. No, not for the duration of their control. life. Not for the duration of their life. I mean, if someone has like OCD and they're so bad that they're stuck in a basement, I would be very reluctant to change anything that had worked. So, I, if a medication worked, I would you know cut the dose down some, try to keep it as low as possible, and probably keep them on the medication. If they had moderate, typical OCD, I wouldn't have any trouble with 
you know, giving a trial and actually stopping it in most people if they want to take that Stopping it. Yeah, I don't think I don't think anybody wants to sign up for medication for life. Well, that's what I've got so but but signing up for behavioral therapy for life is not that big a deal. You only see somebody every few months if if things are going well, or if you start to relapse, then you go back and get a booster. People, a lot of people do that and, and really manage with uh, behavioral therapy once they learn how to do it. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Yes. Um, I guess I have a form of poop out, but not, not exactly what you were saying. So, well, there are other kinds of poop out I'm not sure I want to hear about, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's another lecture. All right. <laughs> we had, I just started a few years ago after having uh, unmanageable anxiety, and um, about half of it is OCD, half of it is generalized. So, we started with packs of very tiny dips, and I it was a meat because because I had the, had not had uncontrolled anxiety and was also helped it was so helped the daily uh, obstructive OCD the things that I could get out of the room. Paxil is one of the drugs that can help. That's right. Because the thing is, I I'm very confused. I want to ask about two things. One is the history of this is, is briefly that we added more Paxil, but uh, it was a it was a it was a it was a small hit, but it wasn't. A so we wanted to get it, it's working good. And we made the mistake of getting me into diabetes. So I went on Paxil, and since then... From been, weight gain, I think? I'm sorry? From weight gain? Yes, absolutely. Belly it's belly that's belly. on the weight gain. Belly belly. Belly. I had a sleep disorder, and my sleep doctor was completely separate. He having a cortisol asset to see if there's just a, a cortisol that is going to go So Depression can raise cortisol, yeah. Just by itself. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> so I have these two questions, but the, the brief history is that when, when we got we took, had to get off the Paxil because that was the, the main, um, you know, the main implicated culprit. Then, since then, it's been like a, a random walk through of a dense forest, like for the three years, an Afrinil, uh, Blue Box, um, uh, effects work, and, and now back to, uh, and then now searching. And we're settled on surgery, and now we want to start Paxil. The reason is none of these drugs since then, none of them have had any side effects at all and any noticeable effects to me. So and you've been going up to good dosages? Very high on an Abbeville, got a blood test, haven't done a spinal tap, so I don't know how well I'm metabolizing the, the surgery. We went up to 400 at one point. In fact, my doctor mm -hmm. asked you for the device. I guess my question is, um, the early drugs that worked had major side effects. And so the, the, the side effects were, came first, taper off, and I, then I experienced some really great. Uh, these drugs have had no noticeable effects on me, yet they, they have had some mild social benefits to people around them, yet no side effects whatsoever. So that, that's the Wait, what do you mean the social benefits? Well, I guess not. So much help. I haven't had so much help for the current drugs in my day. I mean, people around you tell you that you think them? Well, yeah, but what they mean is, they, what this means is that, that, they, that the benefit has not been in the daily obstructive, basically, like getting out of the room with more, less, you know, more easy flow of food. So, it's, again, it's not a home run. I can't really do heavy, heavy data therapy yet. Like, so, my question is one of these drugs affects our which was the one just before surgery, I had a major anxiety and high blood sugar reaction to. I also had a huge amount of side effects, one exception. Caused high blood pressure? Uh, I think so. And But we went to one of the Cindy Bear lectures, that I think was Nancy's sponsor, and one of the doctors, a generalist at Mass General, said that when she gets an OCD patient, she only uses effects for it, but she raises it very, very slowly because of those side effects. Effexor was the only drug that had major side effects. So you, I'm making a mistake and an assumption, but I can't help it that because of my early experience with Paxil, that the side that made, that heavy side effects equate with potential benefit. No side effects equate with nothing. I mean, an afternoon might as well have been an empty capsule. Really? So that usually has a lot of side effects. Very rare, right? Huh? And uh, we went way, way up. It was Dr. Stewart. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we've done augmenting. He's smart about it. And, uh, what does Dr. Stewart say about this? She's supposed to be. She's been in Vancouver now. Yeah, so she's, 
she said that uh, the, the best thing to do would be to circle back to the past, if I could. And now um, I'm being told me about it. Well, let me just say one thing before I talk about it. Have you, heard, have you heard of using Tokamax for the waking? I've heard of it, and because uh, I, I, for people that need to be on Paxlovid or they gain a lot of weight on medication, which the others can cause waking, and then occasional patient, uh, Tokamax, 50 to 100 milligrams, or low dose, you usually no side effects of that dose, will often allow people to lose a pound or so a week. Isn't it? My, my psychiatrist said it might have a depressant. No, it's usually, I'm talking about the low dose, 50 to 100 milligrams. And a lot of people, I use that all the time for the, the weight gain issues. If you need to be on it, I would give that a try. Well, there's a lot of things affecting weight gain. And one of them is sleeping, you know, being up all night, you know, moving that sleep, you get it actually yeah. helps with the weight, so, it's, so it's the diet. So it's, I was wondering what you think of, do you have any opinions or feelings about effects or, I don't hear anybody talking about it. It's one of the drugs that we use. Uh, and it usually doesn't, people don't have terrible side effects on it. The, the worst thing with effects is like Paxil, if you stop it suddenly you can get a withdrawal. It's not life threatening, but you can get dizzy and sick and it's called the Paxil flu. Uh, actually, and effects are does exactly the same thing. Um, it's pretty common. So that, it, when you're on it, it usually doesn't have any more side effects than the other. Well, I was on it, we went up very fast and I had terrible side effects. Yeah. High blood pressure, anxiety, high blood sugar. And I, had, I went off at sort of an emergency. Yeah. emergency. So, did you get flu-like dizziness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't have any of that dizziness or, or any electric shocks or any side effects at all from any drugs anymore. Yeah. Can, am I making a mistake associating that with you know not having those side effects with well the drugs and any other? Um, have no effect. I'm not sure how to answer. I mean, your your experience is if a drug has side effects, then it's likely to work. Yeah, it seems so. I can't really argue with your experience. I mean, that, uh, I don't. I can't explain that because um, people, people. So many new SSRIs. Yeah. Don't know with that. Yeah. I don't. Know, I don't know what to make of it. I can. I can. If you email me, I'll. I'll see. I'll search around. See if I can find anything. Okay. The relationship between effectiveness on a drug and side effects. Yeah. I know that when you start a medication, any medication, if your OCD gets worse when you start it, um, that actually predicts probably that you're going to have a good response to the medication if you can stay on it. Yeah. So if you, not, but I'm not talking about side effects. If you get side effects, that has nothing to do with it. It's only if your OCD symptoms get worse. One of the side effects I'm including in this mission is OCD got worse. Well, so then it, you might you might want to go uh, really slowly, like that doctor said, uh, because that, that that's been my experience. This has never carefully been studied, but you know, there's something abnormal in the brain with the receptors and, and the amount of neurotransmitter being released. And if you give a drug that that uh, initially makes more serotonin there, you would think that it's doing having some effect on the OCD, making worse if there's more serotonin, it would get worse. And then the receptors, this doesn't make any sense. Don't work on. But then the receptors will down-regulate and your OCD will get better. So it kind of implies to me that you're really getting at maybe the, pro the main problem in the brain if your symptoms get worse on the medication initially. But again, it's not, I'm not talking about side effects, I'm just talking about OCD. And probably the same with anxiety. I don't, I don't know that for sure with anxiety. You can think that that would be the case. Yes? Does it have any positive effects with diet anybody have any problems? Diet? Yeah. Uh, as, in terms of improving uh, OCD, we, we many years ago, Gerald Roark was a nice Irish guy, I mean, he, we looked at snacking patterns in people with different things, and we found that people with OCD uh, heavily preferred uh, snacking on carbohydrates uh, over um, other groups. I can't remember what the other groups were, this was probably 30 years ago we did this, yeah, but it was pretty uh, impressive. There were, I think, like, I don't know, a thousand people in, in the study, uh, but using uh, diet to control OCD, I don't, I can't think of anything that's, you know, profoundly uh, effective. Let me think before I say that too strongly. I mean, there are, there's, there's things like St. John's wort, like kerosene, I don't know if you know about that, it's not really diet, but it's, it's a substance that the Germans used to study, you know, to treat depression, and it's a natural substance, but it's still a, it's still a drug, but that, it didn't do much in OCD when I tried it in OCD. So I don't really think I can give you any strong advice on that. Yes. 
the, the dose we usually go to with the Mendo, we start with five milligrams a day, and then go up five milligrams each week. So we'll go five, one week, 10, 15, 20. 20 milligrams, uh, 10 milligrams twice a day is what the, the normal dose we're shooting for. So how long do you see I would give at least three months from now. Three months? Yeah. At what, once you get the high dose, go do it for three months. You're welcome. Which one is the two? Which two? Um, the and the yes, you can, that's usually how we use them. An SSRI. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, they're perfectly safe to use them together, and that's how we would normally do it. An SSRI plus. So have, have one? Interaction each other? Or? No. no, no, they're safe. Okay. Yes. There are very few interactions. Uh, but I mean, there's, I actually have on the, the website you can go to, you can check drug interactions. And uh, when, when I'm putting somebody on, on a medication and I'm not familiar with something else they're on, so I usually check them. But there are very few things like that you have to worry about with vitamins and things like that. There are drugs called MAO inhibitors that you have to be more careful with an part in Yes? Yeah. Uh, just a few things. One, Dr. Doherty was going to speak here, but that lecture was canceled. So maybe next year he'll do that. I don't know. I've noticed on the ads for like a Vilify, they focus on the antidepressant. They don't tell you that it's an antipsychotic. Because if you think they did tell that, people would say, I'm not crazy like that. Yeah. And the third thing, do you use Deplin at all? I don't. I mean, I tried it you know, a few patients in the old days. I didn't really get much effect from it. OK. But some people say that it helps but more with depression, I think. OK. Yes. I have a question. What would you say is the safest maximum dose? The safest maximum dose of blue box per day. We usually go, the dose we usually go to is 300 milligrams. We probably, I don't know if it was me or someone else, went to 600 milligrams. But again, I'd be, you know, when, once you get above the maximum recommended dosage and something happens, you can be sued. So a lot of doctors would be, would be afraid to do that. Are you aware of any adverse effects from being at the No, actually, if people tolerate the the usual maximum dose, then they usually follow even higher. But again, we don't do it in hundreds of patients, so there's not a very big sample of that. In the back. How frequently should you get your blood tested for like levels for medication and stuff like that? We rarely check uh, levels. We mainly just follow clinical response and side effects. Uh, some people check blood levels all the time. I think they they may have a stock in the lab or something in their <laughs> clinic. Um, and often, by the time the lab result comes back, they've already changed the dose. So we, we really don't check any blood levels. And then just for question. lithium, we do things like that where it's crucial, but not for these drugs. And then just another question: I'm on Seroquel, which it seems like I've gained weight and I can't get it off. Is that something that you would say Topamax would help with? Or? Yeah, definitely. Seroquel is another one of those drugs like Abilify that if, if it's really helping you, stay on it. If it's not really helping you, then I wouldn't get off it. But talk to your doctor, don't, don't get off oh, because the lunatic on the talk said that. But <laughs> I wouldn't take that unless it really was making a difference. But, but definitely Topamax might help that. More than half the people on Topamax lose weight, you know, in my experience. Someone else had a question? Yeah. Um, with my son, there seems to be a real correlation. A little louder, please. With my son, there seems to be a real correlation between anxiety and OCD symptoms. Yeah. So in that case, we, do you ever add like a, you know, a, a anxiety medicine along with the SSRI? Yeah, I'll, well, uh, OCD, most people, has a lot of anxiety associated with it. So adding an anti-anxiety medicine like Clonopin is, is very reasonable. Uh, sometimes when you start the SSRIs, people get more anxious for a while, and we'll put people on Clonopin for a week or two and then can taper it off. But it's a safe medication at low dose, and it's, you know, a lot of people are on one of those medicines for anxiety as well. But they can get in the way of behavioral therapy, because behavioral therapy involves stimulating anxiety. So if a patient at the OCD Institute takes a whole bunch of clonopin mm -hmm. before they go to do the exposures, that can actually uh, interfere with it, because you can't learn new things when you have all of this uh, medication on board. Some of the, you had a question? Uh, I'm curious about um, interaction of SSRIs, uh, Lubox, that sort of thing, uh, with uh, alcohol, actually. Question, yeah, any of these drugs, SSRIs, 
uh, with alcohol, it's a pretty standard warning not to drink anything on them. Uh, having said that, 90% of the patients drink on them. Uh, so it, people obviously aren't dropping over dead to drink on them. The, the, probably a good rule of thumb is that like, if you're on one of these drugs and you drink, one drink will affect you like two drinks. What? And then, you know, you'll have a, a bigger effect from alcohol. So you don't want to take a whole bunch of alcohol and then take your, you know, your SSRI medication, medication at night. That could be a problem. But you just have to drink in moderation. Don't drive if you're on one of these medications and even have one drink, I would say. I, I just don't drink at all. Hey, well, why are you here? You're just wondering what the rest of us are doing? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So. Yes, somebody. Yes. Uh, just back to the uh, Well, usually, it's, um, it, most people are not that anxious about being on medication. If they are, then it could be from, from that. But usually, there's something going on in the brain that's producing more anxiety. And that goes away after. It often goes away. And, and these are kind of like general rules. And, and, and you know, any single person, anything can happen. You can get side effects. Through, uh, I saw a woman who got a rash, like somewhere here, a little round rash every time she took a medication. I know the blood pressure medication. No one knew why, but you, you can get really, really odd, weird symptoms with with any kind of medication. There's usually nothing like dangerous or serious that happens. Rashes can be serious. You have to be careful of some rashes. I haven't even seen a, a serious rash in 15 years. Yeah. What time is it? Yeah, we're past? I'm sorry. Denise always says, oh, you're done. It's 8 o'clock. <laughs> oh, you are? You don't want to ever be nice with me. In the old days, you see these times they say, I'll stay here and answer questions till you're done. I mean, you can get like four or five hours later. So I was really happy when Denise said there's a time limit so I can get out of here. Um, okay, well, why don't we stop? Again, my, my, my uh, address is jenneke at comcast.net. If you want more information on any of this, or you can just email me and I'll, I'll be glad to try to help.